Hello. Um, today I want to talk about a 28 nanometer processor. Um, and this is, uh, the Raven project is uh, a kind of, here at Berkeley, is meant to leverage all the RISC-V infrastructure to perform circuit level research. And so I'm presenting on the behalf of a lot of excellent students and faculty who made this work possible. So the motivation of this work is we like to perform dynamic voltage and frequency scaling, or DVFS. So DVFS is a popular technique used to maximize energy efficiency of digital systems. And the general idea is shown in the figure. As performance requirements change over time, you change the voltage appropriately to maximize energy efficiency for the instantaneous performance requirement. Traditionally, this is performed using off-chip voltage converters. And this has a number of downsides. Uh, first, there's slow mode transitions due to the slow on-chip to off-chip feedback loop. Second, there's a limited number of voltage domains. Each voltage you want to bring into your chip needs to come in separately through the package, which limits the total number of voltages you can use and dramatically increases packaging complexity. And last, off-chip conversion requires off-chip components, both regulators and the uh, inductors themselves. So ideally, you perform on-chip voltage conversion, and this has a bunch of advantages. First, the mode transitions are fast, um, which enables finer grain dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. So you can adapt much more quickly to changing performance requirements. Um, you can have many voltage domains by bringing in only one or two voltages through the package. You can generate tens or even hundreds of different voltages on chip. And last, you have no off-chip components, which gives you both uh, area and cost savings, which are really important in consumer electronics. So the overall goal of the project is to create an energy efficient and low cost processor. In order to be energy efficient, we believe that we need to have dynamic or fine grain DVFS. And in fi by fine grain, I mean both in terms of time with short mode transitions to better match changing performance requirements and in terms of space to better isolate high performance and low performance regions. In order for the DVFS to be worthwhile, we need to have high conversion efficiency. In order to be low cost, this converter needs to be implemented entirely on chip. And to avoid just moving the costs from the system level onto the silicon, the area overhead of the converter itself must be small. And last, since this is a processor, it needs to be a real processor that runs Linux and provides a realistic digital load to the system. So there's been a lot of research recently into the best ways to implement voltage conversion entirely on chip. Um, the, the simplest technique is a linear regulator, which is great and can handle high amounts of current, but suffers from very low efficiency at the lower output voltages. Intel has recent, recently been using buck converters, which achieve very high efficiency, but they still require uh, off-chip inductors, whether they're in the package or in a hole in the PCB. Um, if you replace the inductors with capacitors, you can create in switch capacitor converters on chip. Uh, traditionally, these are interleaved, and recent publications that use this interleaved switch capacitor scheme um, report limited efficiency. What this project's about is this, this new idea of simultaneous switched capacitor converters with an adaptive clock that achieves a higher amount of efficiency um, while still requiring no off-chip components. And I should note that for both these switch capacitor ideas, uh, they're really limited to low power applications. Because of the limited capacitive density you have on chip, higher power applications require just too much area overhead. Um, so this slide describes what I mean by the difference between a traditional interleaved approach and our proposed simultaneous switching approach. So typically a switch capacitor converter on chip is partitioned into different unit cells. And on, on the figure on the left, you can see that each of these unit cells switch one at a time. And by injecting only a small amount of current at a time, you can stabilize the output voltage, which is great for a digital system with a fixed frequency clock. The problem is each time one of these converters switches, it charge shares with all of the other converters, causing charge sharing losses. And stabilizing the output voltage at a voltage below the ideal conversion ratio. Our proposed design switches all the unit cells at the same time. Therefore, there's no charge sharing between all the cells. However, this creates a pretty large voltage ripple at the output. Normally, 
if, if you kept the clock frequency the same, this would be a big problem because the digital system would have to operate at the frequency corresponding to the lowest output voltage. However, the transistors would be switching at a much higher voltage um, than needed. Therefore, we changed the clock frequency to match the output voltage ripple. So at the higher voltages, we speed up the clock, and the lower output voltages, we slow down the clock. And if we can adapt this clock perfectly, then this simultaneous switching approach can be more efficient than an interleaved approach. So now I want to describe how we use this idea to generate an energy efficient and low cost processor with on-chip voltage conversion. So at the heart of the design is the RISC-V rocket scalar core with floating point unit. There's also a vector accelerator to improve energy efficiency for more parallel tasks. Uh, both the scalar core and the vector accelerator have their own instruction cache, and they share a 32 kilobyte data cache. All of the caches, as well as the vector register file, are implemented using custom uh, eight transistor based SRAM macros for low voltage operation. Um, there are 24 switch capacitor unit cells that take in a 1 volt and 1.8 volt input voltage and generate output voltages between 0 0.45 volts and 1 volt. The entire 1.2 millimeter squared core is powered by the output of these converters. There's also an adaptive clock that senses the voltage ripple and sends the clock edges appropriately. And an uncore domain communicates with the off-chip world and talks to the core through an asynchronous uh, FIFO. The plot on the right shows the floor plan of the design. So the core itself is about 1.2 square millimeters, while the entire die is about 2.4 square millimeters. The converters themselves are labeled in the red area, and they're distributed around the perimeter of the core. And they consume about 0.2 square millimeters of area. Um, the capacitors within these converters achieve a density of about 11 femtofarads per square micron, which corresponds to about 2 nanofarads of total on-chip capacitance. The switch com capacitor converters themselves are pretty traditional in terms of their switch network topology. Um, the, we have four different modes that take in two different input voltages, one volt and 1.8 volt, and generate four modes, a one volt mode, a 0.9 volt mode, a 0.67 volt mode, and a 0.5 volt mode. So the, the one volt mode is generated by just directly connecting the output to the one volt input, the 0.9 volt is generated by, by dividing 1.8 volts by two. The 0.67 volts uh, divides one by two thirds, and the one volt divides one by a half. Um, all of these four topologies share the same capacitors and simply reconfigure the switches to generate the correct output voltage. Uh, there's a simple lower bound controller that is based on a comparator running at two gigahertz and senses the output voltage, and when the output voltage falls below a reference, it toggles all the cells, injecting charge and raising the voltage. Um, the output of this converter, this toggle signal, is routed as a clock tree so that all of these cells switch at exactly the same time. Um, if you don't adapt the clock frequency to, to this large voltage ripple, we're gonna have huge efficiency losses. So this is how we implement our adaptive clock. There's a tunable replica path that has a digitally programmable number of inverter stages to it. And we essentially send an edge through this tunable replica path. And the voltage um, sent to the tunable replica path is the same voltage seen by the core. And therefore, at high voltages, the delay through the path is small, and the frequency will speed up. And at lower voltages, the delay will increase, and the frequency will slow down. Uh, this is the test setup of our chip. So the, the chip was wire bonded onto a small daughter board. Um, and the daughter board contains decoupling capacitance and some test points. And then the whole daughter board, shown on the right, is placed on a much larger motherboard that has a bunch of voltage regulators and clock generators and is used mostly for debugging. The motherboard is then connected to the commercially available Z board, um, which allows us, which has an FPGA and a network accessible ARM core on it that allows us to communicate through, over SSH from a laptop. So the picture on the right shows us booting Linux on this chip with our laptop. Um, the entire test setup only needs to be plugged into a wall. There's not, you don't really need any uh, equipment unless you're doing measurements. Um, so this is an oscilloscope trace. 
of our of the voltage rail of the processor core um, for the four different DC DC modes. So we start at one volt, we drop it to 0.9, then 0.67, then 0.5. If you look at the zoomed in pictures, you can see the very noticeable voltage ripple. And then the smaller ripples within the larger ripple are basically our clock edges, um, switching all the logic at once. Um, the, the really cool thing about this, the, com the converter transitions are very fast. Um, in this case, about 20 nanoseconds. So this opens up a whole new field of research into really fine-grained DVF DVFS algorithms. So a lot of research papers are looking at transitions in terms of tens or hundreds of microseconds, and here we're, we're showing voltage mode transitions in tens to hundreds of nanoseconds. Uh, last, we'd like to measure the energy efficiency of the complete system. So to measure this, we use double precision matrix multiplication kernel, and the benchmark knows how many operations it completes per second, and we just divide by the average power to get gigaflops per watt. And this number is the inverse of energy per operation. So a higher gigaflops per watt number corresponds to more energy efficiency. The plot on the left shows gigaflops per watt versus the average uh, frequency that the processor is running at. The blue dots correspond to our backup mode, where we essentially use the one volt power gate to send in whatever voltage you want to the core. The four colored points represent the four DC-DC modes that we have on the chip. And you can see that the, those points achieve lower energy efficiency because the conversion is not 100% efficient. Um, there's losses due to the converter itself as well as non-idealities in the adaptive clock. Uh, it achieves, with one of our DC-DC modes, the 0.5 volt configuration, we achieve 26 gigaflops per watt. Uh, the plot on the right shows the absolute power versus delay numbers. Um, so we achieve a maximum frequency of about 950 megahertz using 150 milliwatts of power and a minimum power of about 3 milliwatts at 50 megahertz. Uh, so in conclusion, the goal of this was to create an extremely energy efficient and low cost processor. And we believe that using a simultaneous switching on-chip converter could achieve this. Um, so we showed a design fabricated in 28 nanometers that achieves all these, all these goals. First, there's fine grain and wide range DVFS. We show four modes between one volt and 0 0.5 volts with 20 nanosecond transitions that allow us to quickly match energy efficiency for performance requirements. Uh, the converter is entirely on chip without any off chip inductors necessary. Um, it achieves high efficiency and uh, using the vector unit and the DC-DC converter, uh, we achieve extreme energy efficiency of 26 gigaflops per watt. And all this is on a RISC-V processor that boots Linux um, and runs Python. And while we show this for a general purpose CPU, this strategy of on-chip voltage conversion can be used for basically any digital system to enable DVFS for improved energy efficiency at low cost and simple packaging solutions. Thank you. Did you try any other floating point benchmarks besides uh, matrix multiply? Uh, no, not yet. Um, are you planning on doing that or? Sure. <laughs> so, so to make it work, you have to have something between the synchronous domains where you talk to serial links that are talking to the outside world and your internal stuff. How, how big is the, the FIFO and does that, the latency of that cause you any overall performance problems? Because you know, it does take you longer to get on and off chip um, than it would in a system where everything was synchronous. Right, so th this system only has a level one cache. Um, we don't have a, a DDR connection. Um, so already our on-chip to off-chip communication latency is huge. So crossing the asynchronous boundaries of FIFO isn't very noticeable. Um, in future designs, there'll be a level two cache um, and then ideally a DDR phi. And at that point, yes, the, there will be certain latency costs to potentially separating the L1 and L2 voltages. Um, but in general, the, if it becomes an issue, you just extend the voltage boundary um, further down the memory hierarchy to hide the latency. Okay, thanks, Brian. <laughs>